using this kind of metrics that the return of capital that we use internally is exactly aligned with our analysis on, of the risk on the one hand and uh, the, the capital requirements that we have uh, from the regulation on the other, on the other hand. Uh, a bit in a similar way, uh, we all, uh, I'm sure, uh, use uh, combined uh, ratios, combined operational ratios uh, to steer our um, PNC uh, businesses especially. Uh, we know all the advantages of these kind of uh, metrics. Uh, once we have um, developed an internal model, uh, we can develop what uh, in our company we call economic combined ratio. I'm sure uh, most uh, um, other insurers uh, uh, have the, the, the same kind of um, concept, uh, which also embed the cost of capital in the metric. Uh, and exactly as I said previously, uh, does that in a manner that ensures a full alignment and a full consistency uh, between the business considerations on the one hand and the, the capital uh, on the other, the requirements on the, on the other hand. Um, moving, on, moving on to a slightly wider uh, concept, uh, we, uh, and, uh, uh, again, I'm sure it's uh, something uh, common in uh, all um, members of the of the CRO forums and uh, forum, and also uh, uh, in uh, many of the, the companies that are represented uh, today. Uh, we, of course, uh, develop and use a strong risk appetite uh, framework. Uh, here again, in the way we implement this risk appetite framework, we consider it's a real advantage to have an internal model that allows us to have a very uh, thin analysis of, for instance, uh, what is the measurement of a uh, one in 20 years event on uh, a given risk or uh, uh, on, a, on a financial uh, shock or on a, um, any insurance uh, shock. If we want to set our risk appetite at the level of the, of the one in 20 years we have the measurement. If we want to set it at uh, 1 in 50 or 1 in 100 years, uh, we have uh, the measurement. And not only it allows us to use the tool, but uh, even more important, it's, uh, it is the starting point of a very rich discussion uh, within the company uh, between typically the risk management people and the uh, business people and the CEOs of the, our various uh, operations. Um, moving on again to uh, slightly wider concept beyond the risk appetite, uh, what I said is also valid, I would say, for, for, the, for the entire risk analysis. Uh, and uh, two uh, very important examples of the way we use this ability to fully analyze our risk using the, the, the internal model um, and, and that are worth being mentioned are uh, first, the way we set and design uh, our reinsurance structure. Clearly, uh, all groups that have those internal models have the ability to have very um, precise uh, both analysis and discussions with their reinsurers uh, or with, uh, with their seeding companies, for sure, with, for, for the reinsurers, on the other hand, uh, based on, 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 on those measurements. And again, having the access to that detailed information uh, and doing that in a world which uh, is always consistent with the, uh, with the, the, the again, the formal capital requirements is uh, something we believe uh, is a key advantage for, for, uh, for the company. Uh, and last example uh, on different topic, but of, on, of a similar nature is also the uh, asset allocation or um, uh, more generally speaking, uh, most of our ILM asset liability management uh, um, studies, decisions, uh, we can make them take into account um, the capital volatility that we measure uh, with our uh, uh, internal model. Moving to the, to the right hand of the, of the, of the slide, uh, to complement that more with the 
what we believe to be the, the regulators and supervisors' uh, view and why we believe it is also to the benefit of uh, uh, the supervisors. Uh, the first thing to say, uh, maybe for, I think Bernard already mentioned it, but for the awareness of, of, of top, uh, what we discuss is primarily internal models uh, aiming at uh, capturing um, a measurement of the capital requirements. Uh, that means two things. The first thing is that um, uh, the internal models we discuss here are based on uh, the value of the portfolio of the company, uh, which is exactly similar uh, in, the, uh, in the regulatory environment in which we, we operate to uh, the ones that are used by the uh, uh, the companies that are under um, under a standard um, model or, or, or formula. And I think that's uh, that's an important point for, for the event uh, for the event of that. And therefore, it means that um, uh, many uh, insurers uh, and many jurisdictions already do kind of um, uh, internal model. As such, most of uh, the, the, the regulatory balance sheets that we use uh, are already built on kind of models. Uh, on top of that, um, 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 an environment like the European one uh, allows for uh, determination of specific parameters uh, as part of the standard formula. Um, Next step, uh, the calculation of a particular risk module or type within the standard formula. All these are examples of uh, ways to already use uh, internal models. And, and, and I think the message we had behind is just that uh, we are in an industry, given the nature of our risk, where it's something one can almost not avoid to, at some point, use internal models. What we want to highlight is uh, why we believe it's important, at least for some companies, typically the largest ones and all the, the, the most diversified ones, uh, to have the ability to go up to using full um, internal models. And uh, um, one word to say that a requirement for giving the possibility in a given regulatory framework to use full internal models uh, is that there are important prerequisites. And uh, all uh, of our companies that have gone through that process of having validated internal models who knows, know what it means to have, uh, to develop a strong uh, validation framework, a strong uh, model change uh, policy, uh, a strong data quality uh, policy and, 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 and framework. Those, uh, those three uh, um, uh, areas are uh, at least the, the, the pillars of what makes, uh, uh, what, what is necessary to, uh, as a counterpart to using uh, internal models. And we fully acknowledge that it's the role of supervisors to uh, set clear rules and requirements for that and the role of companies that would like to use internal models to strictly apply those, uh, those aspects. Um, once this is implemented, then that's where we believe it's also to, be, to the benefit of the, of the supervisors. Why? Just because going through all this process of approving the model, uh, of discussing the validation criteria, uh, um, having the, the governance in place for all the future model changes once the, the, the model is, is implemented, is something that uh, uh, makes mandatory a very detailed and specific discussion with the regulators or the supervisors uh, and, and enriches uh, very significantly the quality of those, uh, of those discussions. Um, one, one typical example is that whenever the company would do an M&A uh, deal, or uh, any kind of uh, significant restructuring of its uh, uh, mix of business, 
this changes the risk profile of the company, and this by construction is the starting point to a detailed discussion uh, with the regulator uh, that ultimately has to approve uh, the changes that have to be put forward to the to the model. I think that's most of uh, what I wanted to, to present to you on this slide. Uh, uh, I'm pleased to hand over to, to Fabrice. Merci, uh, so I'll talk about uh, challenges and, uh, and limitations. And you will see that in the paper we address seven uh, limitations uh, when comparing the internal model uh, to a standard approach. And I wanted to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Marty Hansen from uh, AIG Group, who was part of the working group of the CRO Forum that uh, wrote uh, that, uh, that section. And I think the fact that we consider seven potential limitations is uh, sort of a testament to the fact that uh, internal models make boards and management more inquisitive about, uh, about their risk. And uh, when I look at within my own company, uh, we go through a lot of, uh, of validation. We're talking about top-down validation for the board. We're talking about bottom-up validation, which is very, very technical. Uh, we're talking about discussion with the board, the management, and I think that's one of the, the main benefits of the internal model is this discussion about risk that happens within uh, the companies that, uh, that do have them. So in this section, I'll be focusing uh, not on the, the seven uh, limitations, because that might be a bit uh, too long, but we sort of group them into three uh, different topics, which are comparability, uh, model drift and pro cyclicality So starting with uh, comparability, um, I think one of the main limitations we see with the standard approach uh, is that it may uh, work at different risk uh, in the same category. And uh, it sort of gives the illusion of comparability that two companies are alike, where in fact when you sort of scratch a little bit under the surface, you realize that what you've bucketed uh, in uh, the same group is in fact uh, quite, uh, quite different. And that goes hand in hand with uh, some of the things that uh, Gregoire was just uh, talking about in terms of the safeguards that uh, we recognize need to be uh, employed when uh, you have uh, internal models. And here we're talking about common principles, uh, we're talking about standards, calibration standard, uh, validation standard, and uh, essentially the supervisory uh, review and having supervisors that are well equipped to challenge uh, the companies. We, we recognize this part of the whole sort of ecosystem that you need to have uh, when internal models are used by a company. And I think fundamentally it's also about uh, a philosophical viewpoint about the comparability of outcomes versus comparability of, uh, of inputs. And uh, we would argue, especially within the, the CRO forum, that what's important is comparability of outcome so that we've got uh, homogeneous standards uh, of policy order protection. If I move uh, on to this question of uh, potential uh, model drift, and uh, I, I guess uh, you know, there might be a suspicion that uh, initially uh, internal model might be uh, under-calibrated or that over time there can be a drift of, uh, of internal model. Uh, I mean, we can tell, I think, uh, as all the members of the CRO forum, that uh, developing an internal model is quite a significant undertaking. And we will have scars to, to, to show for that. And uh, when I look at my own firm, uh, you know, we spent seven years uh, developing an internal model for the European subsidiary. And uh, some of uh, the fellow members of uh, the CRO Forum have been working on the model since the, the mid-90s. So this is, uh, this is no mean, uh, mean undertaking. And why it's taking so long, uh, I think, is uh, provides reassurance. And uh, it's, uh, it's not so much the technical challenges. Uh, but it's really due to the, the high standards that come with, uh, with, with internal uh, models. So we're talking here about governance of, uh, of the companies. We're talking about the data uh, requirement. Uh, the, the trilogy of, uh, of data criteria sort of comes to mind um, when we, we mention that. But also the validation uh, that is done internally, and I think the, the thoroughness of uh, the regulatory uh, approach and the review that has taken place. Um, I think also uh, it's not a once and done uh, approach when you've got a, an internal model. So there's uh, ongoing uh, submission of logs uh, of changes to, uh, to, to regulators. And uh, indeed, um, I think most of our firms within the CRO forum uh, go through a cycle of uh, major model changes. And uh, this is quite a, a demanding task. And indeed, some regulators are sort of limited the number of changes you can do because this is such a, an onerous process both on, uh, on firms and, uh, and uh, governance uh, authorities themselves. 
Uh, I touched on the first slide on uh, the involvement uh, of the board, and uh, I, I think, uh, again, if I sort of look closer to her uh, in the UK, uh, it's something that's been quite uh, quite significant, and I don't think you, you would have the equivalent with, uh, with a standard approach, and particularly uh, we've had a system of uh, use test interviews to show that management really understand uh, how the internal model works uh, to, to, I mean, maybe not in the, in, in, in the most uh, um, sort of detailed level, but they've got a sufficient understanding for uh, the strategic decisions that need to be made, like, uh, like Gregoire was referencing a, a minute ago. And I think more importantly, uh, when you look at the capital that is deployed within uh, the insurance industry, there is absolutely no evidence of a reduction in the capital since Solvency II has been, uh, has been implemented. So I think that's a question of uh, model drift or sort of is it uh, are we going to undercook the, the figures if you are compared to a standard approach is the one that uh, empirically we can sort of uh, re, uh, refute. So pro cyclicality uh, I think is, uh, is a big issue uh, that we need to, to consider in this debate. Uh, it's an issue of, uh, for financial stability. Uh, it's an issue for policyholders uh, ultimately and definitely an issue for, for, for regulators. Um, and uh, I think um, when companies develop an internal model, uh, the fact that each of them uh, will have a slightly uh, different approach, I'd say, and trying to achieve a common outcome, a slightly different uh, ways of, uh, of getting there, uh, that introduces diversity in the, in the system. And uh, I think that's really a good thing for, for, for the industry generally. And uh, I was going through uh, the different uses of, uh, of the model, and I think the fact that these models are not only used for regulatory purposes, but also to manage the business through reinsurance, through investment allocation, product mix, optimization, M&A, and, uh, and, and so on. That means that it's a better approach than a standard, uh, a standard approach. Well, in a standard approach, I think that there might be the temptation to sort of optimize against that standard approach and uh, a bit of herding behaviors, which I think, you know, by itself, uh, creates a systemic risk, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the potential dangers of having a standard uh, standard approach. Uh, again, taking the example of uh, of the UK, uh, we have got uh, the uh, re ICAS regime that was in place prior to, to Solvency II, and in a way, it's a bit of a precursor to, to, to Solvency II. I would say Solvency II is, a, is an evolution, effectively, of the, the ICAS regime. And uh, again, looking at the track record of the ICAS, it performed quite well through the financial uh, crisis uh, when Solvency II was being uh, developed. And I think we can take some comfort uh, about the robustness of, uh, of this model through a period of, uh, of turmoil. Um, and uh, indeed, if, uh, I guess if I try for a minute to put myself in the shoes of a, of a regulator, uh, you know, I would think about uh, the the failures of insurance companies, and particularly for the market I know, which is the, the, the UK market. And I look at uh, the big failures we've had in, uh, in recent years. Uh, I think on the downline side uh, of independent insurance, uh, I think of equitable life uh, on, the, on the life side. And uh, I think it can quite easily be an argument that uh, I'm not sure these companies would have failed. Uh, would have, would have avoided failure if they had had an internal model, but I'm certainly certain that they would have been much better equipped to deal with the, the flaws, effectively, of their business models if they had had an internal model that, that the standard formula. And I think, again, looking at the, at, at the track record of the, the regime, that is, uh, that is important. Uh, internal model, and again, the ecosystem that comes with them in terms of uh, governance, in terms of, uh, of uses, in terms of believing what you do, from the inside of the company rather than seeing it as something that is sort of artificially imposed from the, the outside. So there were the, the remarks I had uh, about the challenges and the limitations of the model, and I'll now hand it over to Ben Hart to conclude. So, conclusion, very short to also leave room for questions and discussion. We very uh, much appreciate uh, the role that internal models now have in the ICS framework going forward, but we would like also to um, have internal models really as the leading metric um, in the ICS for those companies who can prove that they really um, have all the uh, necessary preconditions 
uh, to run internal models in place. And of course, we are very happy to support this process. We are very happy also to give um, our expertise, our insight, and um, also, of course, to um, have any discussion um, in every, every country, every continent, um, <laughs> where there have to be, uh, of course, also a, a better understanding of those sides that have not the history, have not gone through this process, and perhaps have some more reluctancy, of course, to, to buy into um, such an approach. With this, um, thank you so much. Um, um, and, yeah, want to open for questions. Yeah. Any questions from the floor? Or from the desk? <laughs> There's one from the desk. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a more, more general um, question, and it relates to um, something that's coming up later in our, our um, stakeholder meeting about um, uh, ICS is part of Comframe, um, and Comframe has within it the um, ERM, and more particularly also requirements. Um, and um, as per the consultation we've put out uh, as a requirement for um, all IIGs to have an economic capital model and provide their own own view of their their, um, their, their solvency. Um, how does how do you see that relating to um, internal models for regulatory requirements? Um, and you probably you would have some experience of that in the in the European context as well. So. I wonder if you could speak to that as to how how um, this fits with an overall um, supervision framework. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you're pointing already uh, to a discussion, especially in the um, author context, where you, as a company but also as a supervisor, um, have to deal with the questions um, um, in any case, because uh, to, to reflect on is my risk profile adequately captured by, for example, a standard approach or, or a regulatory metric that is currently in place, and to see and analyze where this does not fit and what does it mean for us or for the company and what do I have to do with this? Should be exactly the dialogue about um, then um, where do I have to dig deeper and where do I simply have to also use internal modeling, internal data, internal intelligence uh, to also show that there is an issue, there is no issue. And so in the dialogue that you are referencing to, I also share this, that this is already going in this direction. And if you would start with author and would take this discussion serious, and push every year further. I think after five years, you would also end up with the companies having all the internal modeling done <laughs> to capture their risk profile in an adequate way. Well, for me, the, well, it's a bit in the name already. You know, we're talking about OSTA. I think the O stands for own, so it's a little bit difficult to have sort of a standard approach and make it uh, make it your own. Uh, and when you look at uh, so within the company, we have uh, some uh, parts are on the standard. Uh, formula of solvency too, some part are on internal model, but certainly we find that as the businesses become more complex, uh, either we sort of uh, spend our time uh, looking at the limitation of the standard formula and then trying to address them with USB and all the different, uh, the different mechanisms, but we sort of pushed in a way uh, when, when the business becomes more complex to have, a, to have an internal model because you, you're sort of trying to address something that doesn't quite fit as the company becomes bigger and more, more complex. So the all size sort of, if you start with, uh, with the standard approach, it becomes a long dissertation about why it's not appropriate and how you sort of address the limitations of it. You, you get also the lots of trade-offs there. Effectively, when you got calls yesterday, for example, oh, we, we would like to deal with internal ratings. We would like to deal with risk mitigation, especially for variable annuities like dynamic aging, and that, or I mean, or other ty other, other type of issues. And you realize when you build in a when you build, build in a framework that effectively certain things are particular to specific type of firms, and certain firms because they have specific risk profile, they will need a certain tailoring of the capital requirement to, to fit that 
to fit better the risk profile. Whereas if we were trying to build a standard method which try to cater for every single possibility there, there will be lots of parts and lots of calculation which will be entirely burdensome for some of the firms for little or no value. And this is why the trade-off there between risk sensitivity for everybody but not with much advantage and you know, complexity of calculation and so on. So I think that actually a certain thing, you know, the standard method will take you to a certain level but there are some nuances there which will be able to capture that. So I'll, I'll build off of Peter's question for a second, um, and, and, and I mean this, uh, tend this more kind of as a constructive criticism question of the issue, and, and I'd be curious for, for, for your views as you talk about setting looking to the IAS to set standards on principles and validation procedures, uh, there seems a tension between, it, even though it's no longer a standard approach, there are some standardized assumptions, methodologies to start getting baked into that that require some kind of approval process. And, and, and certainly one of the values of internal models is this tailoring and I have unique risks. And, and, and that to me is going to be the real meat of it is where you find that balance because I could easily see companies feeling constrained that, well, we have an improved internal model, but we need to change it and, and, and how do we go about that process? I'm just curious if you've thought much down that, that road. Mm. So I absolutely agree <clears throat> that especially for huge international insurance groups or insurance groups, you simply have to dig deeper. Oh. And, and also that means a lot of effort from industry side, but also from supervisory and also regulatory side. And the approach that we took now until we got our internal models approved, uh, approved under the Solvency II regime took us many, many, many years. And um, exactly these kind of uh, starting point on a principle-based view and approach, and then see where really more detailed guidance is necessary uh, without really going into deep rule-based, so this is exactly the validation procedure that you have to follow, but simply to have quality standards defined for validation that are essential that also make you adjust the models if it's necessary from an economic perspective. Um, these are the things you really have to develop going the way. Uh, and, and, and you're absolutely right, this is essential, but also I think is the benefit, if, if you would ask me the, of the benefit of going through this internal model approval process, it was really about exactly these kind of transparency valuation, uh, validation kind of exercises, even though it was painful, but also for us there was, in, uh, there was insight that we got out of it. Um, but again, very difficult to define beforehand, but really something to be developed on the way. Tom Given Specific Life, thanks for the presentation. Uh, to Paulo's point about managing standardization with kind of idiosyncratic approaches uh, to measurement, uh, I would just add the comment that when it comes to models, probably most important to consider them in the context of insurance risk because that's where most of the oh, uh, kind of idiosyncratic uh, measurement uh, gets very involved. Just maybe one comment on, on, on those uh, tensions between uh, um, uh, the standardization and, and, and the, the refinements and of the, the risk measurement. Um, that, that's, uh, well, that, that's where we believe it's important that uh, a framework, um, as early as possible, like I see it, as early as possible in its uh, development, embeds the notion that. Uh, in, in, in our view, there is the possibility of a kind of continuum uh, between uh, ranging from, from the pure use of standard methodologies uh, up to the full, uh, the, the full internal models. And if the standard uh, has been developed 
integrating that uh, um, again as early as possible in, in, the, in its uh, uh, development. Um, well, the, the, we believe really because that's more or less our experience that the rules can be done such that there is overall a consistency in the output of the model. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, having a, a different uh, degrees in the detail in which we, we go. I, I, uh, I certainly would not to come across that sort of, uh, you know, uh, an, an internal model sort of uh, fundamentally. So I think it depends on the size of the company, it depends on the complexity of its, uh, of its structure. And certainly, uh, for me, there's a, a big role to be played uh, by the regulator, uh, I think, in terms of benchmarking. Uh, so as companies, we use benchmarking by consultants, but I think the best benchmarking, obviously, the, the full view of the market comes through the, the regulator, who's very well placed to see whether there's uh, a, a huge uh, discrepancy uh, in the way uh, companies uh, assess their, their, their own risk, which for me would be an indication that this is not something that's going to be well captured by a standard approach because it means that the underlying nature of the risk is, uh, is quite different. I think you're right that in some uh, cases, companies might say, well, it's not really worth it in a way because we believe that the standard approach is good enough in a way and uh, it's certainly onerous to also maintain an internal model on, the, on both the company side and the regulatory side. So uh, that's why partially internal model, I think, have got uh, a, a, a role to play. And there are certainly, but here we're talking about uh, I think in the context of the ICS, really larger companies, complex company where this is, uh, this is more suited. Mm. And, and perhaps one additional remark. In, in the in starting phase of Solvency 2, uh, I think after one year, we also gave up trying to get all the details of the reinsurance business into the standard formula of Solvency 2 because there was no way. Um, and if you look at our natural catastrophe models, uh, you, you don't <laughs> want to start thinking about standardizing them. Uh, but uh, anyway, so there was a deliberate decision to say, okay, reinsurers are applying for internal models anyway, so we can leave them out. But then it's again about what you really are targeting, you know, what kind of insurance uh, business or companies, and what is then, again, the way in between how detailed it has to be and how standardized it can be. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Representing a group uh, using standard formula approach under Solvency 2, um, I thought I, I would take the opportunity to make some comments and say that um, there are interesting approaches with internal models and we we think we should be respectful of, of the work that's done when 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 trying to assess um, specifically risks and, you know, more accurately, but we can see drawbacks as well and, and all kind of risks there, uh, idiosyncratic risks, and, and this is where, well, I think we need to be respectful of all approaches, standard formula, um, and, and, and the other end of the spectrum, the internal models, but then we need um, reassurance that these models are well supervised. Uh, that, that is absolutely key. And then if it's so, but this is costly for both uh, the insurance and the supervisors. Um, by the way, we have, um, you know, significant reinsurance in our group and quite sophisticated sometimes. And until we find a way to, to to, ex to express that in, in, the, in the standard formula because we have those three insurance guidelines. Now, what I wanted to say um, is that also what I think is, is a good thing about internal models is that there is uh, maybe a better link with, uh, yes, a real life and going concern approach, which is sometimes unfortunately missing um, in the prudential supervision. Uh, prudential capital standards, they say they are on the going concern basis, but uh, unfortunately uh, not, 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 not fully. And, and often, you know, um, there is some artificial um, limit drawn with going concern. And, and the, the internal models, this is where they can bring, I think, uh, some uh, value helping to link 
with the SP2 real risk management and help the undertakings um, manage, uh, you know, uh, um, in a relevant way, not, not as if they were going to close tomorrow. That, that's something uh, we think uh, the prudential um, approach is sometimes uh, forgetting. Thanks. Any more questions, observations? I think Lutz, it's your turn. Also, you have to move by four somewhere else as well. <laughs> Very green. Hmm? Very green, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I can start. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, my name is Lutz Wilhelmi. I'm here on behalf of SIS Re and the SIS Actuarial Association. I would like to talk about um, valuing insurance liabilities uh, and just in a more narrow setting than has been spelled out before, just like under the market adjusted valuation with the cost of holding capital uh, margin over current estimate. But before I want to go into that, um, let me say that I'm very pleased and pleasured that I'm talking just after Bernard, Grégoire, and Fabrice, and uh, we subscribe to every single syllable that was said before. Um, so, but let me go in, inside, inside this. Um, What I want to talk about is that under certain circumstances, certain conditions that I will spell out, some of what we have done in the last three, uh, two or three years is actually a little bit obsolete. And that is the question of taking the asset spread or part of the asset spread into account when discounting insurance liabilities. So this is a pretty bold statement. And um, so I put it in the form of a mathematical theorem. Um, and the rest of my talk will be essentially about the proof of it. So um, I'm exposing it. We will also put it into a paper so that you can have a look at it. Um, it's a disappointing fact. It is a very disappointing fact for me because, um, as some of you might know, we have been part of the own assets with guardrails group in the beginning, one of the founding members when we tried to get, get our act together. We had to pull out like a year ago when concerns were coming up that, that we're missing something. And it took us about a year to get like a little bit safe about the fact. So the preconditions are there. Um, if we take market-adjusted valuation, and I'll just repeat what has been said before, market-adjusted valuation is to produce insurance liability by matching fixed income instruments. So not necessarily risk-free, but any kind of matching uh, fixed income instruments that max, match in expectation the cash flows of the liabilities. And from that, you derive the interest rate. So this is how interest rates are derived, also the one in the ICS, derived like that in solvency two in every system. And then you, you leave some risk on the table, the one that the um, insurance risk essentially deviates from the expected, so that the real insurance cash flows deviating from the expected cash flows. And for that, you hold capital. You not only hold it like for one year, but you hold it over the lifetime of the liabilities in each of the runoff years, the respective amount of capital that you need to hold. And who provides that capital? An investor. And what does he ask for? He asks for a return. So 
The cost of holding capital mochi is the discounted returns that we have to provide to the investor in order that he provides the risk capital that makes the runoff of the insurance liability so safe that it is bearable for the policyholders. And by the way, that answers also, Avitex, your question. Uh, it's a feature, right? It's a feature of the mochi that it's sufficient for the runoff in the own company or to the transfer to a different, different uh, company. So, and secondly, and that's perhaps the precondition that can be debated, um, an investor is asking market returns for credit default risk. And to be honest, I mean, I, I know as working for a reinsurer, we are also sometimes asked to take on credit default risk without any return for it. We usually refuse that. But um, obviously there are investors out there that take default risk at a lower price, like private investors. Um, but working for a company that is publicly listed, our experience is Investors in the capital market ask the market price for default risk. But that can be debated. Then, so if you take these two or three assumptions, then the value of the liabilities is minimal if you discount them by risk-free rates. And that also means that the available capital is maximal, so you optimize company value if you are using risk free rates and it also means it's not on the slide or only in the in the bubble over there it also means that the required capital is minimal when you use risk free rates so again a bold like like a bold statement and let's go through the proof um, this is actually like, like the steps that we will take in the proof so uh, we look at the current estimate and its risk we look at the margin over current estimate in pretty much detail, and then the required capital will be just a corollary, like in the end, quickly done. So, um, let's recall how like a stylized, simplified ICS balance sheet looks like. So we have the asset at market value, we have the liabilities, the other green box there in the middle, um, consisting of the uh, current estimate and the mochi, together the technical provisions for the liabilities, and essentially the rest is aggregated retain, retain, retained earnings and capital that make up the available capital of the company. And um, we take that balance sheet and we do two types of risk assessment. One is just with regard to running of the liabilities. We do a risk assessment that leads them into the small blue box there, the runoff cost of holding capital. But we also determine the required capital and in order to do that we have to take the full liabilities and the full uh, assets that, are, that, that we are really invested to into account. Now, let's consider briefly, and in a nutshell, what happens, like what, where is the difference when we discount with risk free and with asset spread? So, um, discounting with an asset spread, of course, it, discount rates are higher, it reduces the current estimate. We all know that, and I think some of us who were there here yesterday have seen like that can be quite significant for some companies, I think you mentioned three or four in that context. Um, good. Um, what happens to the mochi? So the mochi increases. Why does it increase? Well, there is an additional risk that wasn't there before, and that is that the asset portfolio that I'm investing to has yields cash flows that are different from the expected cash flows. Because remember, we have to match the expected cash flows of the, of the default prone assets. So they can be lower 
if we don't observe any defaults, less than expected, or they can be, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the cash flows can be, can be higher uh, if we don't observe that many defaults, or they can be lower if we observe a couple of defaults more than we have expected. So that's clear. So there is an additional risk, and of course, that risk needs to be catered for because we can't just push that risk on to the policyholder in its entirety. The capital provider has to pay for it. And this is how it comes in, how the, why, why, the, why the market price of default risk becomes important. Now, that increases how much is the question. We will come to that in a second. And the next question is, of course, what happens to the required capital? It, one, on the one hand side, it decreases because matching up the assets with the liability cash flows, we don't encounter any spread risk of those matching assets because liabilities move in sync. So it decreases the required capital. However, since the mochi increases, and the mochi needs to be taken into account when calculating the required capital, it increases. So it's unclear where it moves. And I will show you that it goes up in the end if you take default prone assets to replicate your liabilities. All right, so that was an overview, but let's go a little bit deeper into, into this question. Um, and I'm prepared an extra slide for it. Matching future expected cash flows for liability. So the top line is just what I talked about, risk-free. So you start with the middle part, not from right to left, like in, in, the, in the presentation of Peter, but we start in the middle in my presentation. We start with the future cash flows um, of the insurance liabilities. You take them, you calculate the expected cash flows, and then you set up your risk-free portfolio that it exactly matches those cash flows. Um, the remaining risk is that the liability cash flows deviate from the expectation, and that needs to be catered for in the risk margin, in the margin over current estimate. Um, if we take the um, if we take the, the lower part of the picture, we also start in the middle, the future cash flows, but we match the uh, future expected cash flows that are um, prone to default risk. Um, we match them up, and then the mochi has to cater for both. Wonderful. So let's go one step further, and the, the one step is, a, um, is a, like, like just an aside here. Um, Insurance risk and default risk, and I think it was mentioned somehow before, have very different, different properties. Insurance risk is mainly, and I say mainly uh, because it's not really true, um, idiosyncratic. It's not to fat tails. It's well diversified if it's well managed, for example, by an internal, internal model. Um, and it's non-cyclical in no way. Um, Default risk is mainly systematic. We have credit crisis. We have a little bit of an idiosyncratic part in it, but the main part is systematic. It is fat-tailed always. And believe me, I've worked long enough for, for a reinsurer that I know what I'm talking about. Default risk is fat-tailed. It, it is hardly diversified. If it hits you, it hits everybody. The risk tolerance is the same that we are applying, one in 200 years, but the exact price for that risk to, to cover up for that risk tolerance, that is what I will discuss in the sequence, in the, in the, uh, in the sequence of the talk. Um, however, there is another, not a topic now, but a topic for the standard setters and the regulators and the supervisors in the room that they need to take care of. Um, the risk tolerance in insurance risk to systemic risk is arbitrarily large because essentially insurance risk is not systemic. It can't be. It, given the characteristic above, it, it is not. Default risk is different. 
it can be systemic, and uh, I think we have examples enough in the room where this has happened. So that needs to be taken into account. Um, by the way, the proper cost allocation, like also for the risk tolerance of the policyholder, that is very, very important in order to be able to, uh, at the end of the day, internalize external costs that would be otherwise associated with it. So it's an important thing also from a, from, from, from a macroprudential uh, point of view. Okay, so let's go a little bit into the mochi and let's find out how to take this additional default risk into account. So I've said that before, MOCHI is the balance sheet reserves as part of the liabilities that is there to cater for the cost of indemnifying investors to provide this risk bearing capital over the lifetime of the liabilities to make the runoff acceptable to the policyholder. So how much capital is really needed in order to make it acceptable? And what is really needed is of course, in each and every one of year, we have to uh, deal with the one in 200 year event. So the 99% um, is the required capital for that. So now we are sitting in each and every one of year, and we are trying to determine the cost of providing or of hold, well, from the point of view of the insurance company, the cost of holding that capital or the cost for providing, the price for providing that capital from the investor side of you. And for insurance risk, uh, we have already seen that the current assumption or the longest standing assumption in the ICS is 500 basis points above risk re. And uh, I think we are testing another option now with a little bit of, of, of um, um, risk-free part again in the 500 basis points within as part of the 500 basis points. For the default risk, we have to determine the market price of the default risk. And um, that's essentially the market price of the instrument that hatches that risk. So let's try to find out whether we can find a traded instrument that is hatching that risk. And I will, first of all, say, like, forget about the insurance risk. We deal with the aggregation to insurance risk later. Just look at a company that has no insurance risk whatsoever and just has this expected default risk on their balance sheet. So here um, is um, a crash course in portfolio credit default swap pricing. Because a portfolio credit default swap on that asset book that is matching up the liabilities is exactly the instrument that we are talking about. And its price is what the investor will ask for in order to take on that risk. So um, on the hold on, right hand no left hand side, um, we have the portfolio. Um, and up there is the value of the portfolio. And what the investor covers is the one in 200 year loss of the portfolio. So I write it down like the reinsurance treaty for those that are familiar with this kind of stuff. So there is a retention that is up to the one in 200 year loss. That is what the equity provider carries because that's the equity that he has in the company and all the wonderful default losses that occur will be counted against that. And every excess loss then goes to the policyholder, to the white part here. Now, this is the cover. How is the price distributed between the, the owner of the equity tranche, how this is called in PCDS language, and the owner of the excess tranche? And that's very simple. Um, for, and you have to believe me or you have to ask your quant, between 90% and 100% of the price to cover the whole portfolio go to the equity tranche. Why is that so? Well, the one in 200 year loss is huge. 
and most of it is really like concentrated there. Most of the defaults are concentrated there for a high quality portfolio. For a lower quality portfolio, you get some weight into the into the upper bit, and you would hand over some risk to the policyholder. Um, so, but so while this is difficult, and you need a quant in order to do that, um, the total price to get the cover, that's an easy one. The total price is just the spread, the annual spread on that asset portfolio. Why is that so? Now, very simple, that's finance 101. If you ask me to take on that risk, um, I ask you to provide the assets to me. I will double them up until I have a risk-free position, um, and I ask for a little for a little extra margin for my and, and, and fees, transaction fees. Then the next thing that I do when I've received that is I sell the bond portfolio. I buy a risk-free portfolio that has exactly those cash flows that I need in order to pay you off. Um, I pay the transaction fee. I cash in the margin. Off I go. I write the profit, and I never, ever deal with that again. So this is easy. That's the spread is the price for the one-year cover. 90%, now listen, 90% of the spread that we earn is needed in order to satisfy the, the, the capital provider. And maximum of 10% can go to the policy hold. This is what spoils the equation. Now, it before I go one step further, I will deal with the aggregation to insurance risk. Now, this was for a funny company that hasn't got any insurance risk whatsoever. And to be honest, here it becomes really technical, and it took me about half a year to find out how to do that. Uh, for those that are mathematically inclined, we do a risk change. We do a change of the risk measure from uh, from the physical measure to the risk neutral measure, but just for the part of the default risk that is inclined. For the other risk, we stay on the risk on the physical measure. So in layman's terms, you can express it like um, the investor takes the loss that comes from the insurance side first. And then he has a little bit of, then there's a little bit of capital left in the company. If the insurance loss is large, there's little company, little capital left in the company. If the insurance risk is lower than the expected, there's even more capital left in the company. And essentially it's that, that amount of capital that is at risk for the investor. So it's a contingent amount of capital. And we have to combine those contingent PCDSs, prices, for the different cases that we have to sum up. So that's technically how it's done. Um, so when you do all that, you find that the price isn't greatly reduced uh, if you mix in insurance risk. That is something that I found hard to believe in the beginning, and I find less hard to believe after, after having done all the calculations in various examples. Uh, so essentially cost doesn't diversify. So that is what is happening. Uh, and in all the examples that are calculated, and some of them were a little bit prone to uh, calculation errors, not more than, uh, more than 85% of the asset spread needs to be provided to the investor. Good. Now, now comes, there's always, always a point when the taxman enters, and that's usually the point in time when it becomes less funny. And um, as so here, mochi is the pre-tax balance sheet items. In order to provide the minimum 85% of the spread to the investor, you have to earn it and pass it through your P&L. There's no way around it. Dividends get taxed 
before they are paid out. So assuming a corporate tax rate of 25 percent, you have to gross it up, which brings you in the order of magnitude of 110 to 133 percent. And then it's done. Because that means, and that, that is per year, and then you aggregate it over all the years. So instead of having the spread, the annual spread in each and every run of year, you get the total value difference between the, uh, um, the credit prone portfolio and the risk free portfolio. So the mochi has to be the amount that has to be added to the mochi is 110% at least of the difference between the risk-free matching asset portfolio and the um, and the default-prone asset portfolio. So essentially, everything that we have saved by discounting the liabilities in a different manner has to be added and a little bit more into the mochi. This is spoiling the equation. And that is a fact.